Paul, I'm sorry. I'm late. I was counseling a young man and oh, okay. I had totally spaced the time. Sorry, folks. I began to wonder. Well, it's a, fortunately, Skip came and, and uh, told me. He says, you're late. I'm going, oh, my goodness. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Cold enough for you? Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> Cold. Let's see. Do we have anybody online? Anybody say yes? Sorry, everybody. Oh, here we go. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there's so take several the, the notes there. that you were sent. Your Last what week, God is sovereign. Oh, yes, I have. Oh, this okay. Really, I know. <laughs> it's cold outside. Yeah. It's starting to snow again. Yeah, we're not supposed to. No. Right here. It's not supposed to get much snow, right? No, I'm not supposed to get a lot tonight. But you never know. They say you're not going to get it. And then end up <laughs> yeah. What about uh, snowstorm 82, 83 Christmas blizzard? That was a forecast of one to one to four inches. Is that the one that was like 25 inches? Yeah. <laughs> and then after six inches, they're like, yeah, we're going to change it to four to eight. Uh, and then after like 18 inches, they're okay. like, yeah, we didn't call this one. <laughs> we're going to get more than that. Wow. We had we had one one Thanksgiving. It was so amazing. It was literally up to my knees. It was just which for, in my case is <laughs> it's a deep snow. All right. Well, I don't know. Uh, Rich and Linda may not be coming. Marlo is not the top of form tonight. She's not feeling the best. Uh, 24 hour flu or something like that. That's too bad. Oh, she, she's doing pretty well. It could have been something. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started right away. Lord, thank you for your kindness to us. I pray that you would bless now as we study about the sovereignty of God and what this means in our, our walk with you and in counseling others, I pray. Bless us now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, just so you know what we're going to do, this is the, the last one of the uh, attributes of God that we're going to be going through. You can read through the rest of the brochure if you want, but I'm going to be moving on now to... Uh, uh, look at the way that Jesus counseled. Uh, just as we as we think about counseling, we want to see how he how he did this and uh, learn from that as well. And then keep in mind, please, the conference that's coming up uh, in March 25 through 27, and uh, be inviting people to come with you if you, if you would. And pray for people in the neighborhood here that might uh, be interested in a follow-up class for those who have been in addiction. So be praying about that if you would. Okay, we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. We uh, see we had two weeks that we were gone here because of the weather. Almost yeah, so. again tonight. So at any rate, you've had the notes of the others, but I, I'm going to jump on sovereignty of God tonight. Because this, to me, is one of the most important and blessed doctrines in the Bible. I mean, they're all important. But this one, I'm telling you what, this can, can change your attitude about life itself. It can change your attitude as you're trying to help others. Uh, if you can help, if you can teach your friends and relatives and family members this fact, and if they can understand that. God is in control, even when it doesn't look like it. And there are many times we will look at things in our life and we think, where is God in all of this? How can you think that God is in control? Well, he is, and we're going to look at that tonight. Um, the whole term sovereignty of God, uh, as written by one, is God's endless existence and rule, his irresistible will and power. That is a God has said that he is going to do what he chooses to do. We'll look at that. And there is nothing that can stop that. 
And what we're seeing right now in our world politically is the, the, the fear that we have that uh, our world is getting out of control and Lord, where are you? And the point of it is, if you've read Revelation, you know where God is. He's right in the midst of this. This is what we're seeing, Matthew 24 and 25 and Luke 21 and the book of Revelation. Uh, we're seeing the uh, birth pains of this. We're seeing the beginning of what God said is going to happen and the wars and rumors of wars and desolation, all these things. But for the child of God, we do not have to live in fear. We can live in the fact that God is in control, that God is on top of this. He has chosen what he's going to do. He puts the leaders in that he wants to be in power. He puts them in place. Believe it or not, God put Joe Biden in place. And that may be a, a thought that's uh, you look at it and say, that's not possible. God would never do something like that. When he has a plan for destruction and punishment, remember how Israel was punished again and again by the various leaders of the world that God put in place. And if we think we're going to avoid the kind of punishment that we are due, we're kidding ourselves. God has brought these people into power to punish our nation. And uh, we're going to see a lot more in the, in the days ahead, I believe. Well, God's sovereignty extends to his creation. He's a creator of the universe. Everything and everyone the universe contains. He's the creator of every person. Everything that has been made, God has been behind it. Even uh, the inventions and all, God has given people the mind to do these things. And they think that they have thought it all up, but God even directs their thoughts. He answers to no one. Everything is under the will of God, including good and evil. Now, that's a thought that a lot of people push back from, that God cannot be in control of evil. Doesn't mean he's the author of evil, and it doesn't mean that he tempts people to do evil, but he can use the evil of mankind and the the evil of demons and all when he chooses to do so because Satan himself has to submit to God. Look in the book of Job. When uh, Satan wants to uh, harm Job, God says, you can only go this far and you can't go any further. Uh, God sets up the parameters and he is in control. Uh, he is the author, not the author. He is, it's under his will life and death the, the timing of our birth the timing of our death is under the sovereignty of god it's it's a beautiful i love that sovereignty by the way that he's he he chooses when we're going to die you know and in the meantime you're not going to die until it's your time until it's your appointment isn't that isn't that a blessed thought it's in god's hand yeah i tried that yeah <laughs> so, he is, he's in control. Blessings and troubles, even troubles, sometimes come directly from the hand of God. Other times he allows them for our good. But even that is still, he, he can choose one way or the other, but he brings troubles into our life at times to teach us, to correct us, to draw us to himself. I, I tell you what, we grow more in our spiritual walk with God in times of trouble than we ever do when things are going well. Because we need him. And so we are drawn to him in times like that. I don't like trouble. I don't want trouble. But there are times where God says, but you need trouble because you're not paying attention to me. You know, and so if you're not going to pay attention to me, I'm going to get your attention. Our relationships, God is even sovereign over those. I think about how, uh, how some people marry poorly and others marry wisely. But the truth is, when, when you are a young person and you're dating someone, you're drawn to them, you really don't know what you're getting. You have no idea. Uh, my wife and I have been so blessed, and I have been so blessed to have the wife I have because she loves Jesus. And she wants to please him. You can look all over the world and not find somebody who wants to do that. You know. And some people are just lucky. That's and I was blessed. I'm telling you, just God. But He brought her into my life. I remember the first. I remember the first time I ever saw her. To this day, I remember that event. 
I remember what she was wearing the first mm -hmm. time I saw her, the outfit that she had on. I mean, I just, I was drawn to her instantly and I knew I had no chance that she wouldn't pay any attention to me, but God. What was her reaction? Well, her reaction, I think she feels that God brought trouble into her life, <laughs> but that's okay. That's right. <laughs> It, it, trial after trial. <laughs> <laughs> but relationships, God directs us, joys and sorrows. You know, all these things. God is in charge. But we can we can either blame him or we can say, God did this for my good. And one of the passage that we all are aware of is Romans 8, verse 28, yeah. where God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. And the, the fact of the matter is, even when we make a wrong decision, God can use it to bless us, to draw us closer to himself. It can uh, come with sorrows. It can come with pain. But God is perfect and sinless. Nothing he does is sinful ever. <clears throat> God is so perfect. And so we can trust him. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 22. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There's no one like you. There is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. This is should be of comfort to us when there are difficulties in our lives and we're thinking, how can God take care of us? How can God, if, if uh, you know, a single mother, I have uh, great sympathy for single mothers, however it happened. If a uh, husband walks away from her, and now she's single against her will. She didn't want this. But now she's single. God has a special heart for her. And the, the tragedy of it is that it's just like, how, how am I going to take care of my children? How am I going to get them to school? How am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to provide food when I uh, now have a minimum wage job? I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. But one who is following after the Lord, God has said he is going to take care of them. We have so many widows in our church mm -hmm. and you look at that and for a widow in in every generation all down through centuries widows are helpless in many ways especially if they're older uh, if they're older they can't go out and just get a job especially not a high paying job and so there they are struggling trying to find a way but we're, we're taught in uh, first timothy that God as their provider will help them if they will submit their hearts to him. But it's, I feel so badly for them, but to know our sovereign Lord is there for us should help them. Psalm 33 is just a, it's virtually a hymn of praise to God. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. You think about how God created the universe. He did not have to get a blueprint out and try to figure out. He didn't have to study chemistry. He didn't have to study astronomy. He spoke and it came into being because he is, he is so, there, there's no word that can describe the wisdom of God. There is no word massive enough to describe his, his wisdom. There's no calculation he does not understand. God created mathematics. God created music. God is the creator of our world, let the earth revere him. He spoke, it came into being. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. And as he can, if it's not according to his will, listen, if, if God does not want this thing to happen between Russia and Ukraine, it will not happen. I mean, he could stop it in a heartbeat, but it appears that this is for his purpose. He'll need to stop it in a heartbeat. Yeah, he would have to, but he could. He could stop it. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. We, we know of a nation from the north is going to come down into Israel and is going to uh, try to destroy it. That may be what God is lining up. We don't know. It says in verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Talking about Israel, but it was true also of the early days of America, where they believed in God, and they, they believed in Jesus, and they're blessed as no other nation has ever been blessed. But now that they are spitting in God's eyes, 
look what's happening to our nation in every area, every possible area, whether it's health care, whether it's finances, whether it's inflation, whether it's all these things. God looks down and says in verse 13, from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the heart of all, who considers everything they do. Now, one of the things I want us to look at as we're going through passages like this is to examine how would this impact me if I'm trying to counsel someone who's depressed or some other problem that they've got. And, and I believe that we can find an answer for that. Psalm 135, verse 6, the Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Uh, I mentioned before in, in a, another uh, setting that there was, a, in April 2020, there was a lightning bolt that stretched over three states, 477 miles. That's, that's amazing. And God just, he just does it. You know, doesn't, he didn't have to wait for the batteries to charge. He just sends it out. He is in control also of the weather. Now, there's some who believe that Satan is in control of the weather. And in one sense, uh, he may have some influence over only what God gives him, only what God permits. So he still is in charge of it. Isaiah 46, verse 9, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, ancient times, and what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Wow. And this is, God is telling us he can... Not only does he know what happened throughout all of history, times long ago, he knows today what's going to be because he's already there. Nothing can surprise the Lord. Any comments or questions before we move on? Daniel chapter 4 is an amazing example of God's control. This is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. You know the story, I'm sure, where he. He thought he was so powerful, and he was boasting about all that he had done, the beautiful city that he had built. He, he didn't lay a brick, but he claimed to have built it all. And, you know, it's, he's so proud of himself. He's so powerful. Just like today, Putin and some of the others are so proud of themselves, and they think I've got power to do whatever I want. God speaks to him, Nebuchadnezzar, that he was the most powerful man on earth at that time at least in the known world from Israel's point of view. He said, you will be driven away from people. God spoke to him. You, Nebuchadnezzar, will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge the most high as sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone who wishes. Now, you may think that uh, our president, that would be easy for that to happen to him. But the truth of the matter is, Nothing like that happens to a, a powerful man unless God allows it, makes it happen. But he says, you're going to be driven away and you're going to live with the wild animals. And immediately, verse 33, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. And he was driven away from people, ate grass like cattle. They didn't kill him. Uh, they had in the Middle East, the, the feeling toward insane people was that God sometimes would speak through them. And other times they thought that uh, God would bless if they would be patient with the, uh, the insane. But here he was. Uh, he, he did eat grass like, uh, like cattle did. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle. His nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, now this is his, his report, verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. I, I love the connection between those two phrases. I raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. You've heard of Howard Hughes, have you not? <laughs> you bet I am, yeah. <laughs> toward the uh, end of his life, he had uh, 
issues so right along these lines. Yes. He was a hermit. Yep. But his hair grow. His fingernails. His fingernails. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he ate grass, but. Uh, I don't know. He, he didn't eat normal stuff, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, but he may have. But the thing is, he became insane just like happened here because he thought he was so powerful. Yeah. He lost his mind and at the end, living like a uh, impoverished hermit. It's yeah. just crazy. That's called a, a boanthropy. Boanthropy? Boanthropy. Uh -huh. Tell me what that, in, in what way, that he thought he was an animal? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, he says at the end of that time, I raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. And I think that if we can get our counselees to raise their eyes toward heaven and to call on the Lord from the sincerity of their heart, their sanity could be restored or would be. Then I praised the most high. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures for, from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. Noah can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? What a testimony by this most powerful man. And he was restored to his throne. But I look at this and I, he is giving praise to Jehovah God. And I think we'll see him in heaven. I think we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Think, think about that. Yeah. Because he is, he's clearly giving glory to God. He believes in God. And this time, this is before the time of Jesus. And you see that just like Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And here, Nebuchadnezzar believes in God. Now, uh, I, I'm certainly not going to uh, make a huge doctrinal issue of whether he's going to be in heaven or not. But I rather think he may be. Matthew 19. Uh, he had been talking about the, the rich man. He said how hard it is for the rich to enter heaven. And the disciples heard this. They were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. There is, you look at some of the people you think this guy could never be saved. This person could never be saved. This, this relative could never be saved. I don't think there's any way he could ever come to Christ. But with God, all things are possible. And he repeats that. It's said again in Luke chapter 1, where he said, nothing is impossible with God. And then we, we looked at Romans 8 there already. Ephesians 1, verse 11. In him, we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. We were chosen. What a, what a glorious privilege that is. What an awesome thing that God chose us. And you look at that, and maybe you would say the same thing I say. Why would God choose me? <laughs> Why would God choose me? There are so many people who are by nature so much nicer. And Paul would say, why would he choose me? I was persecuting his people, his church. And we can look at our lives and our failures and all this, but keep in mind, in him we were chosen. We're predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And that's that's like Romans 8 again. Conformed, we're predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. He saved us to be like Jesus. He saved us to be a testimony of his grace. And sometimes he chooses what well, tells us in 1 Corinthians 1. That he chooses the weak things of the world instead of the mighty things talks about that he didn't choose many mighty men he goes on and talks about that and uh, but here it, it's telling us he chooses us not on the basis of how wise we are how good we are he chooses us on according to his own wisdom and, and his own love and kindness it says in Romans 9 verse 18 you remember the the story of um, Jacob and Esau and Jacob was a scoundrel. He really was. He was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was a, you could say he was a thief and stealing the, the birthright. But Esau was an idiot who allowed that to happen. He really was just not very bright. But uh, you look at that and say, but it really wasn't fair. Why would God allow Joseph, who was a deceiver, to be um, called Israel? And Israel came from him and all. 
after Isaac and after Abraham? Why did he choose Jacob to represent the nation? It says here in Romans 9, verse 18, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. He hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? But you, O oh man, who are you to talk back to God? So what is formed? Say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? I look at this and I think the man who Jesus healed at the pool of Bethesda had been there 38 years. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And look at that, and that man could easily have said to God, and I imagine there were times where he said, How, why, why did you allow me to be crippled? 38 years. Why? And it was for this very day, that day when he was healed, that God had raised him up. And the 38 years were to show how impossible it was. There's no way you could heal somebody who's been a cripple for 38 years and speak to him and heal him. And he has not walked in all that time. And God, the Lord Jesus, tells him to pick up his bed and walk. You remember the question Jesus asked him before he did this? He asked him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? And that's one of the things we're going to be studying when we study Jesus' counseling methods. Is he goes right to the point often. But one of the things he wants to find out, and he knows already, of course, but one of the things he wants to cause the other person to respond to, do you want to be healed? Uh, an addict. That's a question that you, you need to ask. Do you want to be free from your addiction? Do you really want to be free? Uh, I think I told you about this, this guy, but I'll tell you again. Uh, there was an alcoholic that told me one time, he said, I just, I want to be freed from this. And uh, I called on him in his house. And I went to, to talk with him about that issue, I believe. And, and that was one of the things I asked him. I said, do you really want to, are you serious about this? You really want to get away from this? He said, oh, yes. I said, okay, let's go in your house. We had been standing outside. And remember, I, and I, I had him pour out his beer. I said, do you have some beer in the refrigerator? Yes. I said, give it to me. Let's go over to the sink. And he was horrified. He said, well, this is premium beer <laughs> that my father brought from Canada. I said, I don't care. Do you want to be freed from this? Yes. And let's pour it down. And he did, almost crying. I mean, he did. <laughs> and you know what? God delivered him. God delivered him from his alcoholism. He'd been a drunkard for so many years. And his wife blamed everything in their marriage, the problems in their marriage, on his alcohol. And so when he got cleaned up, she had to blame it on something else. She needed something else. <laughs> yeah, and she couldn't find it. And she divorced him. Oh, no. She'd stayed with him all the years of his drunkenness. Oh, if man. you keep drinking, I'm leaving. She ended up leaving when he quit drinking. Yeah, isn't that something? Or you don't quit drinking, yeah, I'm going to leave. That's exactly it. And, and it, it just to me, she didn't want him healed. Because she had him, she was now head of the home. And now he's he's no longer drinking and he's reading his Bible and he's trying to live for the Lord. And he's telling her, we ought not to do that, honey. And she didn't like it. I'm trying to lead. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it, do, you, do you want to be healed? And that's what he was saying, you know. That was our first class, though. Man. You said that's one of the main questions that you ask somebody. Is, yeah. Do you want the help? That's exactly right. Are you ready? That's the thing, and I have dealt with people who in one, one moment they would say, yes, I, I, I want to be freed from that. But when it came down to it, they would not do the things. The pull was so severe. I, I have trouble understanding that because I've never I've never drunk alcohol at all. I, I don't understand the appeal of it. I just don't. I've, I've seen the destruction that causes it. Uh, we would go down in Chicago to the Pacific Garden Mission. Yeah, we do. Yeah, with Saltier there. And, and uh, I would I'd look at these guys out in the street. They stunk, not only of alcohol, but of everything else. And it was awful. I thought, what, what could possibly draw people to do this? But there is, there is something, it becomes such a habit for them. And without it, as they start into withdrawal, withdrawal is so severe. 
that they just say, I, I don't want to go through that. So they'd rather stay drunk than to go through withdrawal. But uh, God is, is trying to say, hey, do you want to change? Well, these people that are, are saying, you know, it's unfair what God's doing in Romans 9. God is just saying, listen, uh, I will, I think I have a reference up later on. If not, uh, we can come back to it. Okay, our sovereign God gives us free will. This is the other side of sovereignty. It's really not, but it appears to be the other side, and that is our free will. God is in control of everything, but he gives us freedom within his will to make choices and to accept the consequences of our choices. Joshua 24, verse 15, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers that they serve beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's a choice. He says, choose. And God gives us choices. We can choose to sin or we can choose to obey. Um, in 2 Samuel 24, remember the story where David took a survey or a, a, a what is it, uh, not survey, but he went out and what, what are they when they count all the people? What's that called again? Oh, gold. Uh, I forgot the exact word. Somebody on the TV knows about it. But at any rate, he went out and counted all the people, which God had not told him to do, and for census. A census. And the whole thing was, it seems that it was it was done because he wanted he wanted to prove how many people he had for his own pride. That's what it seems like was happening. So he goes and does that, and then God says, You sinned against me. And verse 12, he says, it's like Samuel 24, verse 12, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, shall there come upon you three years of famine or three months of fleeing from your enemies or three days of plague in your land? Now then think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. He says, you have a choice. Well, David chose the one that would go the shortest. And, and in some ways, you look at that saying, I think I would have too. But it cost thousands of people their lives because of what he had done. And he eventually, he pled with God not to punish them any longer uh, for, for what he had done. But God gave him the choice. And God gives you and me the freedom to obey or not. Genesis 2, 16, the Lord God commanded man, saying, from the tree of the garden you may eat freely from any tree. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. And they began to die that very day. But in Genesis 3, verse 6, when the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she decided to disobey. She knew she wasn't supposed to do it, but she decided to believe the serpent, Satan, rather than the Lord. And she took from its fruit and ate and gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. He was with her. He could have stopped her. That's why he is held to be guilty more than she was she was deceived but he wasn't and uh, he could have he could have stopped it but they chose to disobey <clears throat> and with our choices come consequences and god will work it all out for the good eventually but this is one that you look at and say how can this bring glory to god and it has and will in the days ahead and we i'll get on a rabbit trail if i go to that one <laughs> But uh, God gives us freedom to obey. He gives us freedom to love him or not to love him. Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Told in Joshua 22, be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of God, gave you to love the Lord your God. Uh, we're told in Matthew 22, 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. God could, in his sovereignty, have forced us to love him. God could have said, you're going to love me. If you don't have any choice in this. You're going to love me. I want people to love me. That would, be love. that would not be love. 
Love is only true love when it is freely given. And God wanted us to love him because we wanted to love him. But he gave us the choice. Even though he's sovereign, God could have said, you're going to do this. But he said, no, I want it to come freely. We have freedom to love others or not. <clears throat> and in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And I think of how many Christians defile the church of God by not loving others. By having, and I, I know of two women who are at odds with one another. And it's displeasing to the Lord. And they need to get that straightened up. But we can make that choice. I, I refuse to love. You know, our, there, are, there are articles I have where children are, are mistreating their parents or walking away from them all, are not honoring them at all. That's a choice that they've got. And they're paying a terrible price as a result. We have freedom to forgive or not. And I start thinking about these as you're teaching these people of the freedom that they've got. They need to understand you have freedom to forgive others. You can do it. And people say, I can't forgive it. That's not true. You can. God can enable you to forgive, but you've got to be willing to. And that's, again, what I would say. You want to be healed? God's giving you a way out here. You can forgive. Ephesians 4, verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Malice is the desire to see someone hurt. To see someone suffer. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as in God, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. See, he, he says, This is what I want from you. You can choose to obey or not. We have freedom. We have freedom to be truthful or not. Proverbs 12, 19, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Proverbs 14, a truthful witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. Uh, did you know that you could lie by telling the truth? There are you can lie by telling the truth by the way you tell it. A person can say, yeah, I did that sarcastically, to deny that he did something like, I really did that. But he's telling the truth. And if somebody comes and says, well, you, you said uh, that you didn't do it. I didn't say it. I said I did it. He's deceiving. A truthful witness does not deceive. And what do most defense lawyers do in our world today? Deceive. They deceive. That's the game to them, is to deceive. They know the guy's guilty, but they they just go on and on by saying, no, 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 he didn't. He deceives and he's telling lies as a result. Ephesians 4, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head of <coughs> Christ. I was talking to the young man recently in counseling and I was trying to, to teach him the value of telling the truth. We were going through Proverbs together. I was sharing, so you, you understand, it's, it says that the uh, the tongue has the, the power of life and death. And he didn't understand. I was explaining to him that if we can destroy somebody's reputation and we can actually cause someone's death through our tongue. Uh, you probably read about the young girl who uh, she kept telling this one boy, I think he was a boyfriend for a short time. She said, you need to kill yourself. You just need to kill yourself. And he finally did. He finally did. And she was held accountable by the courts to a certain extent. I don't remember what they did yeah, to her. I don't remember what yeah. But she had the power of life or death in her tongue. And we just have to remember, we're going to be held accountable for that. So we have freedom. We have freedom to believe or not. John 1, verse 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But then we find in Romans chapter 1, all the way down through that entire chapter, especially from verse 18 on, that God says they, they have, they, they knew, well, it says uh, in verse 21, even though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God. To give thanks, they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Therefore, 
God gave them over, verse 24, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. He says, you can believe or not. You can choose not to believe. It's, it's not that you, it's not that they don't know there's a God. They just have willfully chosen to ignore him. It says they just totally ignore him. Uh, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they're without excuses. They've seen him. They know he's there. Done my purpose. Yes, they choose. I, I was, do you remember years ago, there was a man who was constantly trying to shut down the uh, nativity scene in Denver? It, it went on for several years and he would sue every year. And all, uh, David Horesh, I believe. No, 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 that's another guy. David, I can't remember his last name right now. At any rate, I was teaching a series on evolution and he, I don't know how, he's, I think we took out the newspaper ad. That's what it was. We saw the newspaper ad. And he came to our building. We were serving and we were worshiping at the time. And he put posters on every car, flyer on every car, talking about, you know, this is a lie, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, well, our ushers went out and took them off before the church ended up. So that people didn't see those as such. I wouldn't care if they did. But he, uh, did I call him or he called me? I think he called me and said, you know, you, you say that there's a God. I, I want to debate you. Yeah, he did call me. So I want to debate you. And he, he was part of Mensa, you know, Mensa yeah. organization. Uh -huh. and it's, a, it's a group for people who think they're smarter than everybody else. And he said, uh, I want to debate you before Mensa. I said, I will do that if I get to choose the topic. He said, okay, go ahead. What do you want to choose? I said, I want to choose resolved Evolution is a religion and not a science. I said, that's what I want to debate. He says, okay. So he comes, he comes to the debate and he has a hand, uh, he has a stack like this of a Bible and commentaries. And he's been studying commentaries and all this to find objections to it. And he puts them up. He was going to go first. He puts them up. The thing. I said, excuse me for interrupting, but let me ask you a question. Didn't we agree that we we're going to talk about evolution is not a science? I said, I'm already willing to admit, I believe that there's a God by faith. I'm willing to admit that, so we don't need to debate that. I want to debate science. You'll notice I didn't bring my Bible. I didn't, I'm not debating the Bible, but let's talk science like we agreed to. And he was dumbfounded. He was still there like, he wasn't prepared. He was, he was, so we went on and I, I remember taking down the trail where I, I said, where, where did the human beings come from? Where they evolved? Where did the animals come from? Well, they came up and where, where did the first cell come from? You know, in the primordial soup that you've got there. And he said, well, you know, it coalesced down through the billions of years and it came about. I said, where did the dust come from? He said, it came from the big bang. I said, where did the Big Bang come from? And, and he said, well, it's, or where did this material that exploded come from? He said, it's always existed. I said, prove that. He said, I can't prove it. I just believe it. I said, ah, oh, that's your faith. That's your religion. What makes your religion more valid than mine? And he just stood there. And of course, at the end of the, of the debate, they vote to see who won and hear it. At Mensa, they they said I won the debate. It was just crazy, but I mean, here's a guy who he he sat in my office. We were talking one time. I don't know if it was before or after. And I told him what I believe. I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that he was born of Mary and, and all this. I think he had a Catholic background, possibly. I don't know. But he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, "I wish I could believe that. I wish I could believe in God." And, and I think I said, well, you, you can if you choose to. He said, I, I can't. It's impossible for me to believe that. Well, we have the freedom to believe or not. And we have the freedom to receive the consequences of our choices. Yeah, there you go. Romans 1, 28 through 32, once again, God tells them all these things that you're doing because you didn't see that 
he was worthwhile to retain in your knowledge. God gave you what you did pray by to do. Uh, in verse 29, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, or gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do them, but approve of those who practice them. All of these things are in our world right now. Every one of these things. It's the consequences of their choices. But our sovereign God loves everyone, and he doesn't want anyone to be lost. And it says here, God is patient. This is 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, if that's his will, why aren't people saved? Why, why is not everyone in the world saved? Because that's his will. What would you tell somebody? He said, well, I don't understand. He, it says here, he's not willing for any to, to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But not everyone's coming to repentance. Why not? Because he gives them the choice. He gives the free will. That's the balance. God says, I have made you, this is being part of the image of God, where he made us in the image of God, to have freedom of choice along with the consequences. He says, I give you that because I want your love to be free, freely given to me. And that's why he does not force anybody. Here's a phrase that we ought to all remember. God will not force anyone into heaven against their will. He's not going to. He's not going to drag you into heaven and say, I don't want to go. I don't want to come in here. That's not going to. He's not going to drag you in. So it's fine. You don't have to. But our freedom to choose condemns those who refuse to believe. Second Peter 3. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation, but they deliberately forget. That's an important phrase. They deliberately forget. It's a choice. They choose to forget this or to ignore it. Deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Freedom of choice. This is what they get because of that. So how can we apply these truths to our lives? Well, one of the things I point out and in counseling, this is such a powerful thing. The sovereignty of God gives us confidence in a wicked and violent world. God is in charge. He is our protector. And Nothing can harm us without his permission. Think about that. God loves us so much. And yet we see Christians who die from disease. We see Christians who die from violence. You say, how can that be God's will? God does not have to explain to us how it all comes together. He just has said he loves us. Nothing, that he is so sovereign, nothing can harm us without his permission. But what it does give us is the ability to handle disappointments, and illnesses, unfair treatment, failure, slander. If we realize that God is in control and will use his experiences, he will use his experiences, these experiences to develop our character as children of God. If we realize God is in control and will use these experiences to develop our character as children of God. That's what he wants to do. And this, this sentence, I think, summarizes God is more interested in our character than our comfort. Mm -hmm. God wants to develop our character rather than merely make us comfortable. So God is sovereign. It's a glorious, glorious doctrine because we can depend upon the power of God. And that he wants nothing but the best for us. And he's trying to develop us to become more and more like Jesus. So even in times of sorrow, times of disappointment, we can turn to him and say, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. That helps. Uh, even though something may be going on and you have no idea, you don't, you 
do not understand. Yeah. But keep in mind that God is sovereign. Yes. And He's in control. And He's loving and kind. So all, all we need to do, or what we need to do, is trust Him. Trust Amen. Him. Amen. There was a, a song out years ago called If You Cannot Trust God's Hand, Trust His Heart. In other words, if the things that have happened to you, more or less from his hand, are painful, uh, not desirable, trust his heart to know that God has the best plan for us if we will submit our heart to him. I love that. Well, that's it for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we confess that many times we forget about your great love. We forget about your sovereignty and that you have the perfect plan for us. We forget that you're in charge of every step we take. And if we will submit our hearts to you, you will bless. If we disobey you, there's a consequence for it. I pray, Lord, you guide us and help us to be able to encourage others with this glorious truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Next week, I plan to uh, begin a study with you, as I mentioned, about the the techniques of Jesus are not techniques in the sense of psychological techniques, but they are principles that we can follow when we see how God, the Lord Jesus, dealt with people and their problems. How did God deal with this person, this woman? How did he deal with this man? Why did he say this to him instead of doing something? Why? And we can look at it and find their principles here that we can use in helping others. So I, I hope that y'all will. Tell others about it, those of you on, online, encourage others to come. And uh, I'm going to try to advertise this to people in our church as well. God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, can I ask you a little bit about this big faith thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, the people that want to push the big bang theory, to me, that doesn't make any sense because any and every explosion mm -hmm. I've seen is chaotic. Yeah. How can they, I guess by faith alone, they can convince themselves mm -hmm. that Big Bang caused specific order by chance. Order, order out of chaos. By chance. They, they believe that given trillions of years, that the universe organized itself by chance and that everything we see in the universe is a result of that. Even though now scientists are debating once again whether the Big Bang ever happened, because they've come out now and they, they believe that, they're, that Einstein was wrong when, when he said that uh, the speed of light is the ultimate. And you can't go beyond the speed of light and they're finding things that can. <laughs> so they're sitting there or arguing about that now, and some of the uh, of these scientists are denying that there's a big bang. And uh, frankly, I I think there was something that was instantaneous. I don't think it took billions of years for dust to collect into planets. God spoke and it became. Yeah, absolutely. And so if yeah. you think of that as a big bang, I said, well, okay, I'm fine with that. It happened instantly. It suddenly appeared. Boom! It's there. Light. That is supposedly millions of light years away is already here on planet Earth as it comes and strikes our planet. How could that happen? Because when God formed light, He didn't have to wait. He could put it in place when yeah. He chose to, right yeah. then. Yeah. So it's to me, it all comes down to this: Do we believe there's a God? And and scientists now are starting to realize there has to have been an intelligence behind all of this. They won't call it God. <laughs> But they recognize it has to be that because the other explanations are so foolish. And I was reading this last week that Darwin plagiarized the idea of evolution. He didn't come up with it. Where did he get it from? There's a guy that was uh, back in the early 1800s, before he came along, that actually postulated even the things, uh, what was the phrase that Darwin used? But Darwin actually copied some of the exact phrases and just changed a word here or there. Huh. And it's uh, it's been written up. There's a book out on that now. I can research it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So 
So maybe that's what they're talking about. The Big Bang Theory is when God spoke the earth there. He's like, I think we need an earth right above there. Bam. It's, it's there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to just say, like Bob Ross, I have a tree. <laughs> I'd like to study the phrase that he created um, out of the water, it says. Oh, yeah. And I'd like to say, what, what does that mean? Pretty out of water does it mean that where it came up out of water? But uh, I think it's more to that somehow. And I don't know exactly how that works. Oh, well, 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 I think we'll find a lot of things in eternity that we'll, yeah. we'll realize. Hey, Paul? That probably 